Hello everyone. Uh, so we're going to be, so now we know how the solar and the, the planetary disk formed and uh, how we may have some planets. So now we have a series of presentations about the habitability of uh, the Earth and then you'll hear tomorrow I think about Mars and some other, some exoplanets. So indeed uh, the, the Earth we all live on, so there is a lot of life <laughs> on Earth. And uh, so far, it's, uh, and to the best of our knowledge, it's uh, the only planet that hosts life with these constraints that that's the form of life as we know it. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that's the only forms of life, so we would need to know what we're looking for if we're looking for life on some other planets. And it is actually very unlikely that Earth is the only uh, inhabited planet. So uh, uh, before we move on with some uh, facts uh, for the Earth, I would like us to go, to go together through this uh, slide that has been proposed by the NASA in terms of uh, the, the criteria that, makes, uh, that make a planet uh, habitable. So whether a planet is uh, habitable, uh, or which means also can host life, uh, doesn't mean that it's inhabited, it means there could be life there. So there's, that's, that's an important uh, point. So this depends on the complex network of interactions among the planet, other planets in the same uh, stellar system, and uh, the star uh, they orbit uh, around. So the standard uh, definition for a habitable planet is one that can sustain life for a significant period of time. That's an important aspect. It's based on our experience in the solar system. And as far as we know, li so life requires water, so liquid water. Uh, it requires energy and it requires uh, nutrients. And again, it is as we know it today on most of the uh, years. We'll see that there can be some uh, subtle changes depending on where we're looking on the planet. So uh, the habitable zone is the region uh, where the, around the star where the planet can receive the perfect amount of heat to maintain the, this liquid water on the surface. And this is the case current days uh, for the Earth. However, as researchers discover unexpected environments that can sustain life, the requirements for habitability on exoplanet are being uh, redefined. So, and, and in particular, uh, as we are learning that uh, potential habitable zone, we know that all the planets may not, uh, may not host uh, life. So an example, for instance, in the habitable zone is a planet, of, the example is that of a planet uh, that would be uh, tidally uh, locked and that would show on always the same face uh, to the star. So then in that case, uh, this would lead to an extremely hot uh, face of the of side of the planet and an extremely cold one, and that would potentially not work. And there are some other considerations that are brought, but I uh, took those that really um, apply to the, to, the, to the Earth, because that's really the, the basement uh, uh, that paved the way to define uh, the search for life elsewhere. So I thought that it would be good uh, in the term in, as we are defining habitability on, on Earth is to spend quite some time actually to know what are we talking when we talk about life on Earth and the kind of habitats uh, that are inhabited on, uh, on Earth. That's not, it's not exactly a trivial thing and that's not necessarily something you all probably not all uh, think about. So here we do have a, a, an inventory of uh, the, the number of cells on Earth in the different environments, in the different uh, habitats. So currently, the, the inventory, uh, we know that uh, on the Earth, we have about uh, one 10 to the 30 uh, cells habiting the, inhabiting the Earth. So, and this is mostly archaeal and bacterial cells. And most of them are actually not on the surface uh, and the eukaryote, the eukaryote cells, are, so we'll talk about it in the next slide, but it's orders of magnitude below in terms of cell numbers. So most of the, most of the life in terms of, uh, I would say, if I may say individuals, so those individuals, they live uh, in the deep oceanic uh, subsurface uh, for uh, almost uh, half of them. The other half 
is in the continental, in the deep continental subsurface. Then we go with one order of magnitude less in the upper oceanic sediments, a little less in the ocean, and we have also a bit in the soil. And then, so we are like in the orders of the 10 to the 29 cells uh, in, those, uh, in those habitats. Then when we go uh, uh, toward the surface, like groundwater, phylosphere, the cattle, termites, pigs, humans, seawater layer, atmospheres, etc. So we are decreasing by a thousand, by 10,000, by a million in terms of cell numbers. As we do, uh, those cells, most of them don't, they, 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 they don't live as individual cells. Most of them uh, live in, uh, as in biofilms, so in colonies, and so they help each other with different uh, uh, metabolic uh, activities. So that, I think that's important when we try to look uh, for life elsewhere and to define the habitability of the Earth and where it is, how to the parameters that have to be uh, taken into account uh, later. So since I've started to talk about archaea and bacteria, so we'll go to the next slide and just as a quick reminder uh, for those of you who might not be biologists, so the life is, is, uh, uh, is divided in uh, three large domains with the bacteria, with the archaea, with the eukaryota cells, and we are here uh, among the chordates and we are at the, at the top of one of these uh, little branches. So this, this uh, tree of life here is not perfect, is not really exact, a, more, a schematic one that would be more appropriate is this one with the different uh, way, the, different way uh, the, the three domains are rooted. So we do have uh, the, the domain of the archaea uh, that is branched with the shared domain between archaea and eukaryota and they have what we call the LUCA in the, in the past, that is the least uh, universal common ancestor. And one important point is that it might not be a single organism. So that's, it has a number of common properties to all uh, life on Earth. But even if we looked in the record, in the geological record, we might not find, it's very unlikely actually, that we find one organism that has all the properties of the LUCA. It, that's how life was at this point. So I described a bit uh, the, the number of cells, so the individuals that are on our, on our planet with us. <laughs> um, now it may change when we start to consider the size of the things and the life we may look at. So here this is a, 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 a scale, so we go from 0.1 nanometer to the atoms to the, 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 the humans. And how we can, uh, uh, the observation tools that we may use. So the large size above uh, like uh, uh, tens of a millimeter, we, could, we can see them with our eyes. Then we, if we go to a little less than a micron, we can use the light microscope and then we have to go uh, with electron micro microscope. So most of the cells I've just talked about, uh, they are located in this range, so around the micrometer size. So we're talking about a large number of cells, but they are very small and so they are very difficult actually to see. So that they require most, it's difficult to see them with the light microscope unless we do have some specific uh, uh, staining or uh, we have to use the electron micro, micro, microscope. And when we talk about the, the uh, eukaryote cells, so you see here the, an example of an animal cell, of a cell plant, of a human egg, so those are much larger. So that brings me actually uh, to the next slide, but before, uh, bef before I move on, so just a, a, a quick information about the difference between bacteria and, uh, and, and, and archaea. So, the bac so they have tens of difference. Uh, but basically, if you want a general idea, so they are very different mostly in their membrane and in their cell walls. So the bacteria membrane is made of ester-linked lipping with deglycerol. They are basically a straight chain. Whereas uh, in archaea, this is ether-linked uh, lipids with uh, L-glycerol and this branch, uh, branch chain. So for the cell walls, uh, they have also different cell walls, but I'm not sure we really need to go into details. We can talk about it later in if you're interested. So given the different sizes of the different uh, uh, in, the, in the three domains of life, 
So this is now, uh, now interesting to move on, at looking at life, not in terms of cell numbers, but in terms of mass. So here, that's a, a publication that's convenient in terms of the description of uh, the biomass and its distribution of, in, the, in the different uh, Earth uh, habitats. So what you see here is that the, the, the archaea and the bacteria that were, most, that were most of the cells in terms of cell numbers, so now they are a, a, a lot less in terms of mass. So at, at present day, so most of the, the mass in terms of the biomass, this is currently in the form of uh, uh, biological uh, cells uh, among plants. So that's about a little less than uh, uh, 500 gigaton of, uh, of carbon. And the other ones are a lot less. Now, if we go to uh, 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 some, some, uh, uh, some, some, some cells in organisms that we are really interested in, like the animals, which we belong to. Uh, so you see first that uh, it's uh, only a very uh, small uh, uh, mass of uh, organic carbon, bi biological carbon. Most of it is described uh, uh, between uh, uh, the corals, the cnidarians, as well as the, uh, the fish. And then in the, the mammals, I, found, I find interesting to uh, highlight that uh, we actually, uh, as human beings, we have, we have been really good at colonizing the planet. And we actually represent, in terms of mass of carbon, more than all the other uh, wild mammals. So that's uh, something. Uh, so that's how you can see also life on Earth. So the individuals and then the carbon, uh, the carbon mass. So and it's it's different and it's mainly related to the size of the cells. But all of these big cells here, they appeared much later in the evolution as well. So the specific uh, uh, shape of the polygons here, they don't have any specific meaning. It's just for conveniency. Now we can uh, move on and looking at the, the, how those uh, um, uh, th that carbon is distributed in the different environments in the in the in the in the six uh, uh, domains of, uh, of of life. So what we see here is that uh, uh, most of the biomass in plants are in the terrestrial domain. We have uh, quite some amount in the deep uh, subsurface and we have a little bit uh, in the marine environments. And this distributes very differently now when we look at the relative abundance uh, of uh, these uh, uh, domains uh, in the terrestrial marine and subsurface as a fraction of the biomass. So you see that the plants are almost 100% in the terrestrial domain then the fungi are also mostly uh, terrestrial. Then we do have uh, the protists that are a little less than half in the terrestrial domain. And as we move on, so we're going to have the, the animals with most of them in the marine uh, environment. And then when we move on with bacteria and archaea, I think I, you got the message that they are uh, mainly located in the deep subsurface. So that's a uh, that's really, that's really interesting to, to look at it. Then uh, we can look also at these organisms and this biomass and how they work and how they are related to each other in terms of uh, trophic chains. So where are the consumers and the, uh, uh, the producers located? So on Earth, right now, so at present day, so in the terrestrial, dom the terrestrial domain is, uh, uh, is dominated uh, by the producers, while the marine domain is, uh, is, is defined mostly with a ratio of one to five uh, with uh, uh, consumers. So there is a balance between the producers in the terrestrial environment and the consumers into the marine environment. So that's, that's how life is shaped now at present day on, uh, on Earth. So just a quick uh, information as well. When we talk about the deep soft surface uh, and in this publication and in many others, so we are defining the subsurface by everything that's uh, below 10 meter uh, below the, the continental surface. And that's the same uh, also in the, in the subsea floor. So that, that excludes uh, the soil that really interacts on a very short time scale uh, with the atmosphere. As we mentioned so most of the biosphere in terms of uh, individuals, so the cell numbers 
are located as a function of uh, are located at, at depth, and also and so I wanted to show how this distribution the, the cells those cells are distributed as a function of depth, but also to give you an idea of that we also have cells in the atmospheres in the in the clouds. So when we start with the uh, with the cell numbers at the surface here, this is a graph that. Uh, so those two graphs, the left one is for the subsea floor, the right one is for the subcontinent, and then I will talk later on about the, the clouds. So we do have this distribution, so it's in log, uh, log of cell concentration as a function of depth in log, so we are here uh, 10 meters and we are here a kilometer below the surface. And what you see is that it's very, it's very common uh, that the, we do have uh, cell numbers on the order of uh, 10 to the... So uh, uh, a billion of cells uh, per cubic centimeter of rocks or uh, subsurface uh, material when we start from the, the surface and then uh, as, uh, as we go as a function of depth so there is a logarithmic decay of the cell concentration until we reach uh, the detection limit uh, of cells so here the limit in terms of uh, cell densities that you see is uh, located around uh, 10 to the uh, uh, 1,000 or 10,000 cells per cubic centimeters. This is not an absolute uh, and a theoretical limit. This is related to our uh, current ability and technological ability to detect cells. If, we, if the technology progresses, and it's been the case over the last two decades in particular, when I started to look into those data, so we're potentially limited to 10 to the 5 cells per cubic centimeter. So now, we, after a decade, we reached 10 to the 4, so an order of magnitude, and now in some of the most detailed studies, they even go to 10 to the 3 or 100, even 100 cells per uh, cubic centimeter. So, that's, so I want to stress that point, so this is not an absolute uh, limitation, so that's, li that's really dif deeply related to our uh, current ability, technological ability to detect cells. So you see that there are, there are a lot of um, uh, cells as a function of depth and at least to a, a, a kilometer. And most of the studies and the compilation stopped at about a, a kilometer, a, a little, little low here. You see it was a paper in, a 20, uh, in 2012, here it's uh, 2018. And so as we move on, so the, 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 the compilation go deeper, the compilations go deeper and deeper. Here it's in the subcontinental and you see here that uh, they went to uh, 10 to the minus 2.5 cells per cubic meter centimeter and even a little lower. It's a little easier in the subcontinental seafloor due, due to the kind of samples that are handled. So for uh, the subsea floor, so it's often soft materials and uh, they, are, they can be uh, subjected to contamination Whereas in the subcontinental, so when we reach uh, the depth of uh, a little more than a, a kilometer, so we're already in the, in the hard rock. And this is often some uh, deep uh, water reservoirs that sometimes have been also isolated from the surface for millions of years. And so it's actually easier to collect the water and to do cell, con to, to do cell counting in the water rather than having to count the cells uh, into the sediment. So it's very, it's a, there are some very practical limitations in the way uh, we define uh, the cell concentrations. So, but that's, uh, there is this uh, it decrease and then we don't know exactly whether that's really hit the limit at some point at depth or there is maybe a curvature and this could extend uh, lower. So that's, and when we try to think in terms of uh, uh, searching for life elsewhere, so that might be actually a little challenging if we want to look at this kind of life as we have it mostly uh, on Earth. So uh, uh, a bit about the, uh, the cells in the, the, the clouds and that might be also uh, more practical in terms of looking elsewhere than on Earth. So uh, uh, because there is a, we do have some uh, 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 incense water cycle at the surface of the Earth, including in the atmosphere, uh, in the clouds, uh, the, the more people look at the, the scientists look at the, at the clouds and observe the clouds and also do microbiology in the clouds, uh, they find uh, cells. 
Here, that's a, a, a picture, so the, it's, a, it's a really bad example because the, the, the authors didn't put any scale bar <laughs> on this one, but that's how it is. It's probably, a, I would say, a, a hundred micron or a couple of hundred microns for these uh, al green algae cells that were collected in the clouds that hit uh, the top of the, of the Puy de Dome. There is a, an observatory uh, there that is dedicated to, the, uh, to some experiments and, uh, and measuring the, the, the properties of the clouds. And uh, uh, in particular, so those uh, are uh, green algae and uh, their uh, genetic characteristics show that uh, they are not local ones, so it's not algae from the, the top of the, <laughs> this uh, volcano. So they potentially actually come from the, the Atlantic Ocean and not only from the coast, they potentially are uh, from further away within the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So they, that's, that's a way to see that e even in the atmosphere, there could be actually some life. And when looking at different planets, so that could actually be more convenient than looking at the most abundant one within the, within the deeper. So you have less on the top, you have more in the deep, but in terms of conveniency, so I let it to the, 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 exobio, the people look, doing actually the, the, the experiment and the analysis there. Uh, they are, of course, so the, the units of course are different because they are measured, the density is measured in terms of number of cells per cubic meter of air. So usually, so the classical uh, range is uh, from one to 10 to the five uh, cells per cubic meter of air. So that's, uh, that's something that's doable. So basically we are uh, in, on a planet where there is life everywhere. Everywhere we've looked for life, we found some. And if we didn't find some, it was most of the time due to a limit technical or limitation. And when the techniques have improved and we went back to the, the same places, so we've been able to look for for life. I say we, but I've, I've never, that's not the kind of thing I'm doing, but I'm talking generally as a, as a community. <laughs> so now we'll go to the, what this in particular in the subcontinental uh, 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 environments, what does this represent in terms of the, the volume or the, the, the area on earth that could be uh, inhabited? So we take, so that's a, I will refer a number of times to this uh, little logo. It's a, it's a book uh, that's been published in 2020. Uh, I had the, the privilege to be a, a, a co-editor of, of this book, but it's not the most important. The most important is that it uh, collects the work that has been done uh, by a couple of thousand scientists over 10 years uh, looking at the deep carbon cycle. So whether we are talking about biology, and that goes down uh, to the carbon in the core. So in this book, you will find a lot of things and interconnection between the interior of the planets and uh, the outer parts of the planets. And I will uh, talk um, about this in a, in a couple of, in a, in a number of slides. So here there's a, this uh, oh, magic number, 120, 20 degrees C. Who knows what 120, 20 degrees C is? What does this represent? The limitation of the life. Okay, that's a broad, that's a broad definition. <laughs> so it's a, little more, it's a little more specific than that. So that's the maximum temperature to which organism, uh, an organism, which is a hyperthermophile, has been cultivated in the lab. Okay, so that's something very specific. And because I've showed in the last slide that it's, we don't exactly know where is the, the limitation of life at depths. So for conveniency, that's what we currently take as the limit of life in terms of temperature. It's not absolute, that's what, as, as of we know it today. And so Cara Magnabosco, so she's taken the different uh, geothermal gradients uh, on the different, uh, so she's made, so that's how she's done some inventory. So she made a, a, little, a little grid of the, uh, of the continents and then assigned a geothermal gradient to each of the, the little uh, square here. And then uh, with the appropriate uh, geotherm, so she uh, converted that in colors. And uh, the colors uh, represent uh, the maximum depth uh, for life in the in the the, conti the continental uh, settings, 
So you see with the light uh, yellow, so it's limited to uh, uh, less, than, well, less, less than three kilometers and we move on. And you see that in the, in the places, uh, in the, 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 the old continental part, in the cratons basically, where uh, the geotherm, so the evolution of the temperature as a function of depth is the lowest, that's where uh, potentially there could be life down to 10 ki 20 kilometer depths. So that's never been proven, but theoretically, if we, if we take that limit of life at 20, uh, 120, 22 degrees, that's how deep uh, biosphere uh, could uh, thrive uh, within the continents. So uh, the situation uh, in, the, in the oceanic domain is very uh, interesting. Uh, it was in the, the early, uh, the early uh, 2010, uh, within the, uh, the International uh, uh, Oceanic Drilling Program, which is now the uh, International Oceanic Discovery uh, Program, and that will unfortunately stop at the end of 2024. So the, the boat, the ship that used to do, do all the drills that are necessary is going to the end of his, its life uh, and also due to the cost of energy. So the international community, that's an initiative that is led by the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the National Science for the Foundation. So it will end operation at the end of 2024. So there won't be any more uh, call for uh, drill at this point. So, uh, but at the, at the beginning, the first half of the 2010 years, so there was a, an expedition that uh, has been uh, called, so it was the IODP expedition 370, and the name of this expedition was t Limit of Life. So um, scientists drilled um, uh, in the Nankai uh, trough of, uh, sh um, of, of the, 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 I think it's the Shikoku Island, and, in, and they picked up a particular location where uh, the temperature gradient uh, is super high. So with the idea that without drilling too deep, they would quickly reach this 120, 22 uh, limit of life. So that's not exactly uh, what happened. So here you have a number of graphs, they're a little crowded, but you have here, um, so they drilled down to a, 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 about a little over one kilometer, so 1.2 kilometers. Uh, they counted the number of uh, cells, uh, active, uh, active cells. So the, f the field point, that's uh, the, the, the cell counts that are above the detection limit. And uh, the empty ones, that's where they counted cells, but that was be below detection limit. And that's the same here for the endospore uh, concentration. And there's a correlation with the environmental factor uh, along this uh, core. So there was a fluid uh, all the way down uh, with uh, uh, varying salinity. So starting something that was probably close to the, the salinity of the ocean, then it decreased, it stayed uh, kind of low and then it cre increased again uh, below a kilometer. Uh, then we do have also here the temperature. So, well, we were at the limit of life. And at 120 degrees C, so they also expected to find the limit of life because there's, there's also a difference between the limit of life found during cultivations in the lab opposed as the maximum temperature in nature. Temperature in nature usually, so the common assumption is that we would not find anything above 70 degrees C. Because at that point, I will talk about it later, it's, it's a bit expensive in terms of energy. But that's not exactly uh, what happened. And you have here the, different, the, the, major, uh, the major zone in terms of uh, uh, what's there. So the, 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 the trench with sediments there, uh, the basin transition, uh, sediments from the, 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 lower, uh, play, the lower basin, some hydrothermally altered sediments, etc. And what they found is that that's something that's actually very um, uh, common when we describe uh, the cells in those environments. So that's everywhere, every, each time there is a discontinuity, then there is a kind of uh, increase in terms of cell uh, numbers. So that's the case, that's the case here. So you see there is a logarithmic decay of the cell numbers, then it raises again 
when we reach this discontinuity here, then it decreases again, stay well almost. Uh, see. So if, if they have stopped the drilling at a thousand meters, so they would say, well, we found the limit of life. But now, so you see, it starts again, and it starts again in a zone where there is uh, some uh, apparently some hydrothermal activities. Here, where there is a decollement, so there isn't so much active cell there, but it uh, triggers uh, a lot of uh, the, the rays of the, the endospores at that point. So again, the field point that's for everything that's above detection limit and the empty ones they've looked for, but it was below detection limit. The kind of work that is done to do all these uh, uh, cell, cell counting, so here uh, it's a fish a green staining for the, the vegetative cells, uh, but uh, and for the for the, 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 the mostly the, here we do have a lot of, uh, of archaea, so that's really difficult to see them. So maybe so here, that's an example of uh, the sediment or the, the, the rocks in which uh, cells were counted. So um, um, there are some greenish uh, bright spots. So not, not my laser pointer, but some other ones potentially here. But here, just at the top of the arrows, you have little round cells, a little uh, less than a micron. And that's actually the archaea cells uh, that they've been uh, looking, uh, looking for. So that's how they, they, they saw that there is indeed uh, some uh, uh, activities. There, there are cells there, and not only there are cells there, but in terms of metabolic activity, they are actually active. So that is done by taking the cells in the lab, uh, putting them uh, with, uh, 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 with isotopic labeled nutrients, and then uh, using uh, ion spectroscopy to look how, how that works. And they found that in this zone, in this particular zone uh, between uh, 100, uh, so below uh, 1,000 uh, 1, meters, and in the range between uh, 100 and 120 degrees C, uh, there is isotopic evidence uh, for hyperthermophile that uh, perform uh, acetate uh, degradation. So they use some uh, organics that are in the sediment and uh, to make uh, their, their energy. So not only there are some cells to uh, some reasonable concentration, but at, at that depth, the cells are active. Okay, so that was the T limit of life, but it's no more the T limit of life. So the t obviously, so the, the temperature limit for life in nature is now uh, beyond the 120, 20 degrees C. And it's a, no it's a it's an open question, so there's a lot of, you have a bright future <laughs> on, those, uh, on those topics. And uh, in terms of metabolic activity between uh, 80 degrees C and uh, 80, 90 degrees C, so that's uh, mostly uh, methane, uh, methane is produced and oxidized in the, in the community that is down there. So that was, so I've showed you two ex examples for the continental setting. Uh, the oceanic setting. But now, so here that's a compilation that's been proposed uh, by uh, Merino and collaborators. So the different environments uh, where uh, life has been uh, found and even in some of those extreme conditions. So you see here that uh, going to very cold uh, location uh, to uh, deep sea uh, anoxic lakes and brine, we do have the deep sea hydrothermal vents and we'll have there will be a presentation on that particular topic. I think it's on Thursday. Uh, so there is the deep sea uh, sediment and trenches, and I will talk about it. Marine and continental subsurface, we've elaborated on that. Soda Lake and hypersaline lakes, nuclear contam contaminated sites as well. All the ophiolites are pretty rich in terms of uh, uh, life uh, down there. Also the uh, acid mine uh, drainage, although it looks very uh, inhospitable. So it has a particular, uh, for, there are particular forms of life there with communities that are super efficient. Even in the desert and the arid environments, uh, the hyperacidic lakes, lakes of the, of the volcanoes, the hot springs, uh, mud volcanoes on the surface, uh, but also in the ocean, some of the, uh, the shallower hydrothermal vents and the cold seeps in the mud uh, volcanoes. So basically, in the very uh, soft environments, as we all always think of life, of course there is life, 
but there is also uh, uh, rock-powered life uh, in uh, all the subsurface environments, whether they are mild or pretty extreme. There's been also, uh, so since we know that uh, temperature does not stop at uh, 120 uh, degrees C, uh, there's been a, a renewed uh, uh, interest in trying to go deeper and deeper. And uh, in those slides, so there's no direct evidence for life. There's no cell counting. There's no cell observation in those particular environments. Okay. But I'm going to try to show you how we do, we can also find some other evidence of, uh, of life. So here, this is, a, 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 this is a, an, another uh, international uh, oceanic discovery uh, program uh, cruise that has been laid in the Izubona Mariana uh, subduction zones. So the number of colleagues have investigated uh, serpentine mud volcanoes. So they go from, uh, so you have here uh, in the subduction zones, you have the subducting slabs and there are uh, mud volcanoes that go that arrive to the surface and in they, they manage to bring some deeper samples. So there's been one here, uh, the South Chamorro uh, mud volcano, and there's another one, so that's been uh, uh, studied in detail by Plumper. And there is another one that is a little uh, northern, that's not on this picture, but that's exactly the same setting that's been investigated by Debray. So in those bird volcanoes, so you find them at the, at the, at the, at the surface or uh, when they, they, so basically they work on those deep samples. When it goes to the surface, of course, there is always the issue when you look at life, if it's been, it's be, if it's been contaminated uh, by the surface uh, biology. So, but looking at those, uh, those deep samples, this uh, serpentinized uh, dye appears. So they are soft enough that they can bring a lot of different kinds of rocks and including some other serpentine minerals. So in this setting, so this distinguish uh, the, the deep uh, forms of serpentine, its name is, on, uh, sub, is uh, antigorite, and uh, that is uh, usually a brown or green. And they found also uh, blue uh, serpentine. And so it was a thing, so they looked in detail with high resolution techniques. So you have here the, the sample, so they look at serpentine, the blue serpentine clusters uh, here. So the size of the sample that is uh, investigated is about 500 microns. And then you go at, uh, with a deeper resolution, with focused ion beam uh, cutting, and then do uh, infrared high resolution, uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy, or some chemical mappings. And you see they end up with identifying a lot of characteristic uh, 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 spectroscopic lines uh, that uh, are characteristic of uh, organics. But at that time, so in 2027, so uh, Plumper showed, well, there are a lot of serpentine class. They are rich in organic matter, and that organic matter uh, could be potentially uh, from a biotic origin. But be careful, on Earth, there is a lot of organic matter that is not necessarily biotic in origin. There is biotic, and there is abiotic organic matter. And it's not always trivial to distinguish between the two kinds. So when I hear sometimes, oh, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to look for life, we're going to look at organic matter. Oh, okay, well, how, you, how are you, you going to discriminate between the, the biotic and the abiotic organic matter? It's not a trivial question. But on Earth, we know that most of the time it's actually <laughs> biotic unless, unless it's very, very deep. Um, Debré and Tal, uh, on the, uh, so they were a little, well, technique have, ad have advanced and they were a little more lucky. So they looked at another uh, 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 mud uh, volcano, so, and uh, isolated those uh, blue uh, and uh, those blue serpentine that are here in this graph, and I will comment that in a minute, uh, the, the blue serpentine versus the classical high pressure uh, form of serpentine that is the antigorite. And, um, they didn't look at the organic matter. They actually looked at the carbonates and at the isotopic signature of the carbonates. So that's what you have here in this graph. That's the isotopic uh, signature of uh, the, the inorganic carbon in the form of carbonate, uh, 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 the, the heavy carbon, as a function of the total inorganic carbon. And here, what you see on this graph is that the normal, I would say the normal antigorite, so the abiotic, typical uh, petrology stuff, that's the things that are happening geologically in the subduction zone. They have a very different signature than the one here 
uh, with the blue serpentine, the, the, the carbonates that are within the blue uh, serpentinites. And that train here going to very, uh, going, pointing to very, light, uh, to very light carbon is actually specific from a, bio a biological activity. So the, the, the biological reaction, they don't like the heavy carbon. Kinetically, it's not fav favorable. So they, they really prefer the light carbon. And the way they could interpret it with some other, uh, uh, some other uh, observations that I don't necessarily report here, is that this carbonate light signature is consistent with ana anaerobic microbial uh, consortia, so it's not only one kind of microorganism, it's a series of microorganisms, it's a consortium, and uh, it's a syntrophic uh, methane oxidation that's coupled with sulfate reduction. So they found actually evidence for deep life in that particular context, conditions of 20 kilometer depth and potentially more, not looking at the organic matter, not trying to find as hard as they could life into some rocks, by using the, the isotopic signature. So that's the kind of thing. So potentially, uh, so here there is the 120, 22 degrees C isotherm that's reported in that context of the subduction zone that is already pretty deep in th this setting, but maybe in some of those deeper samples, there could be also traces of life that, are, that is recorded in the carbonate, in the isotopic signature of the, of the carbonate. So if I want to summarize before I move on with some other uh, uh, geological consideration. So basically, so I reported here the kind of geotherm uh, for, uh, well, general geological ge the geotherm here. This one is a little uh, steeper uh, in ice. So you, you see that at the surface or subsurface of the earth, we are clearly within the, the liquid water and uh, that continues at depths. Uh, it's also when we go into more uh, physical information here, that's the phase diagram of water with the two forms of life. There is a, a, a high density water and a low density water. Low density, so that's how the water molecules are organized. You have the low density water in blue, the high density in green. So the life is mostly in the low density water uh, regime. And now, so that's uh, here a, a graph that represents uh, uh, the, the, limits, well, say the limits of life as we currently know it in terms of the main parameters, pressure, so that's the, this blue, uh, the, 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 this line here, the salinity, the temperature and the pH, and the slight difference between the culture study, that's the a little deeper blue here, and the environmental based study uh, here. So there's a little bit of difference, of course, as you know, in temperature, but there is also the same for pH. Uh, the same for uh, so high and low, P, uh, low and high pH. Uh, for pressure, we are, don't know necessarily very well, uh, but here for the salty things as well. And that actually corresponds also to what we know in terms of uh, the, the water that, 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 that's superimposed with the, the conditions for the chemistry of the earth, uh, the chemistry of the water on the earth. Now, if we want to go, I, I will go a, a step further with the and I will switch to geology. If we try to interface what I've just said uh, with the minimum requirements for life and what the, the earth actually can provide to life. So liquid water, I won't necessarily talk too much about it because that's really the thing that everyone talk about. So I don't think there's really a point to uh, uh, spend some time on this. Uh, one important uh, uh, aspect for life in terms of requirement is that it has enough of the uh, element building, uh, the, the, the building blocks and some other trace elements that are uh, required for the metabolic activities. So the basic element is that carbon, uh, life requires carbon, hydrogen, uh, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and sulfur. I will talk about uh, many of, most of them, uh, but the phosphorus, the, phosphor, the, the phosphorus cycle on Earth, we don't know it particularly well and there's no published phosphorus cycle at this point. There is a big issue is how to solubilize the, the phosphorus. It's, it's not a trivial uh, thing. Um, I will talk some, uh, about energy, about the conditions where for which there is most of the time life is that when we have water, uh, when we have enough of the elements and when we have a chemical disequilibrium and when, when the, each time there is electron that can be transferred, there is life. And then uh, the requirements for life, it's also stability over time. 
although the conditions at the surface of the Earth have changed uh, through geological times. So I will go with the how the Earth provides what we call the life uh, essential uh, volatile elements. So here you do have a distribution of the, the carbon in the different uh, uh, Earth reservoirs. So we have a reference of the bulk silicate earth here with uh, 1.4 10 to the 9 uh, gigaton of carbon. And then as we move uh, uh, toward the surface, so we have less in the inner earth and then there is orders of magnitude when we go to the uh, atmospherics, you know, what we call the exogenic um, envelopes of the, of the earth. So there is, there is enough um, uh, carbon of, on, on earth. Uh, provided uh, a little thing is that currently most of the earth, uh, most of the carbon, sorry, is uh, uh, located and stored uh, in the core of the earth. So th we, don't, we don't have the exact carbon budget in the earth. So it could range, the concentration could uh, go, f could be uh, from one, 0 0.1 weight percent of carbon in the outer core uh, to one weight percent. There could be in that case also some uh, carbon stored in the outer, in the inner core. But there's really a, a, a really huge reservoir of carbon within the Earth. The question is, is it available uh, to the surface and can it replenish uh, the surface to make uh, carbon available uh, for life? To do that, I will, uh, in the next slide, compare uh, the distribution of these uh, uh, life essential volatile elements in the different uh, terrestrial and chondritic reservoirs. Here you do have, uh, it's represented in terms of a ratio of carbon over nitrogen, carbon over uh, hydrogen, carbon over sulfur, and I added here, although there's not the corresponding graph, carbon over oxygen. When we try to do this work for the uh, interior of the Earth, uh, it's very difficult to go with the absolute numbers. So we tend to work with ratios or with the isotopes because the, the inventory is very difficult to make. We have to make comparison with the different meteorites, but how those meteorites actually correspond to the exact composition of the Earth, we are never quite sure about this. Well, we have some good ideas. So you have here all these ratios, and I've compared those uh, ratios uh, with uh, what we have in cells. So here, uh, here you do have that in more persons, so the relative amount, so we do have uh, more uh, hydrogen than carbon, a little less than oxygen, and a little less than nitrogen. It's a little different uh, for budding yeast. Most of, the most of the data are actually available for the human body, but the, the ratios are not changing that much, and they, are compri they correspond to those kind of, uh, of ratios here in a weight percent. So how does that uh, compare? So here when we do have a, a higher ratio, that means, for instance, uh, that for uh, nitrogen, so we have a high ratio uh, for in cells. Uh, we do have uh, high ratios here in the in the cores, means that it's uh, the the, the, the part, this envelope is uh, is depleted. So basically, if we uh, co if we come if we look at so you have here the the bulk silicate earth. You have the core. You have the mantle. You have the exogenic envelope, and the scientists usually try to compare with the different kinds of meteorites. So what we see is that for, for carbon, so the, 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 the bulk silicate earth is slightly uh, depleted in nitrogen compared to the, the carbonaceous chondrite that are supposed to be really important in the building blocks of, uh, of life. Uh, for uh, sulfur, it's about the same, and that's the opposite uh, for hydrogen. So you see we go from one side to, to the other. So what we see, uh, and then we can compare what's happening in the cells uh, compared to the bulk silicators or to the exogenic envelopes. So you see that for in, uh, in, in living cells, so the carbon-nitrogen ratio is 4 to 10. So it's, uh, it's, a it's about the same or within the same order of magnitude as the, the exogenic reservoir. Uh, for the, the carbon, uh, carbon of a hydrogen, it's a little different. So we have, uh, we have less, uh, less hydrogen uh, here than in the envelopes. And uh, for, uh, the, for the carbon of a sulfur, it's the same order of magnitude also that can be discussed, and there's no point uh, going over that. So basically, uh, there is enough, uh, this ratio are, are globally consistent uh, 
in life and in the earth and in the, the, the earth envelopes, at least the uh, exogenic ones. But there's one thing that is, uh, that is, that is important, is that when we go back uh, to the history of the Earth and how the, the, the way the Earth formed, and uh, Manuel started to touch upon that this morning, this is that uh, when, the, when the Earth uh, first accreted, so, there was, so it was hot, there was a magma ocean that formed, and this proto-Earth, Manuel said this this morning, so it was pretty dry actually. And if we take that and nothing else happened, probably it is very unlikely that we could have had life on Earth. And there wouldn't be any exogenic envelope that have the suitable concentration that is more or less in accordance to what we have in life. To do that, there are lots, so it's been solved by isotopic uh, measurements on rocks, it's been uh, solved partly at least uh, by doing a large number of experiments um, and basically I will make it short so the only way to do it uh, is to add to the earth after the core was formed is to add it another planetary uh, body probably uh, had, that had to be uh, differentiated quite of a large size that was that had a mantle that was carbon rich and that had the suitable high of high C uh, carbon over sulfur and carbon over nitrogen ratio to add those life essential uh, volatile elements to uh, the mantle that could be later degassed. So that's, that's how it's been done here. And potentially, so that's one of the major events. This large event here, I think that you've heard about it, it's basically the, the, the moon forming impact that happened after uh, the core uh, of the Earth was, uh, was formed. That was potentially not enough, so it probably required what we call the late veneer. So small, water-rich, carbon-rich uh, particles that hit the surface of the, of the Earth. That's the only way to do it. And the right size to do that, and I will uh, go uh, with another slide, it, it has, we do have some constraint on the size of the, 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 planet, the, 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 the embryo that hit the, the Earth to make this. It was probably uh, between 1.1 1. 1 and 0.2 uh, Earth's uh, Earth mass. This has been uh, confirmed, so here that's, uh, so I said that a lot of this has been constrained by experiment, but that's not enough, so here uh, this study by Grewal and, uh, and collaborators, so here that's the same scenario as the one that uh, I, I just proposed, but they had to compile and to use data science uh, uh, to look at the, the, the silicon, uh, the, the, the sulfur content in the core that's compared with the bulk, the bulk sulfur in the earth and uh, the, 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 the partitioning between uh, the, the, the iron, so the metal alloys and the silicates uh, to look also at the bulk carbon uh, as a function of the bulk sulfur and uh, another partitioning here you do have so that's that's the entire set that's consistent with what we know that could happen from the experiments so you had to change the ratio you have to change uh, the um, uh, the pressure temperature conditions the oxygen fugacity a lot of parameters and here that's not only a compilation of those data it also uses uh, data science to produce that, and that's a comparison here with some uh, a number of uh, uh, meteorites. So they managed to show that indeed uh, that's uh, something that could be suitable with some of the, the, the carbon ashes chondrite, but not all of them. And then uh, from that, they could also assess the size of the impactor, again, by looking at those ratios and at the, carb the potential carbon concentration. And so that leads to this trend here. And when you compare uh, so, uh, some uh, known body like Vesta, the Moon, or Mars, there's only something that's about the size of Mars that is suitable. So that confirms also what we knew before and brings some other constraints. So that's how some of the, those uh, li uh, light uh, living, ele uh, living elements that were bring to the, the, to the, to the Earth, it's to this uh, giant impact. The name of the impactor was uh, Tia. So then I will go to another aspect, that's the, the issue of the energy. So here I just show uh, an important point, that's, uh, the, so, that's, so that's a particular metabolism that's in, been investigating here, that's the sulfur 
uh, reduction here. So in, uh, in terms of uh, femtomoles per cells and per day, so going uh, from a small amount to a 0.1, and as a function of uh, depth in an uh, energy-limited uh, system. So you see that here, so it's really decreasing very uh, quickly as a function of depth. Uh, I took this example here to show you that under energy limiting uh, conditions, so a cell basically would need uh, approximately uh, 1 to the minus 70 kilojoule per day. So that corresponds uh, here, just to give you an example, is, it's, is if like this cell, this cell would uh, respire one uh, mole of sulfate uh, every day, and that for 30, for 30 years. So that's, that's the kind of, it's, so it's very, very little. So never forget that when here in this uh, deep uh, part of the, the Earth, so the cells, they don't ha they, they have some activity, but they don't necessarily have a very intense activity. So some of the cell consortia, they have replication time of a couple of days, but that could go to a hundred thousands of years. So it's not one cell, but it's the cell uh, community. So it's very little. So that's probably as little as it's been, it's been described in the literature. When we go to hyperthermophilic uh, microorganisms, so such as those that I've described in the t limit uh, samples, so they need actually more energy because temperature uh, induces a lot uh, strong damages to the cell and in particular to the proteins. And so the cells need some energy to, uh, to fix or to repair uh, the damages. So in that case, they need a thousand more energy per cell and per day. As a comparison, we require a lot of energy. <laughs> so that's the, basically what I deduced uh, from uh, our uh, daily uh, diary, recommended diary. And that corresponds to an energy to a, a power of uh, about 10 to the 15 to 10 to the minus 6 watts. So it spans uh, a, a large range. So it spans a, li a large range, but basically to give you the, the general um, uh, idea, so life adapts its space to uh, the, the energy and the food that is available. The more, the more energy, the more food, the higher uh, the cell density. And then as we go as a function of depth, so the energy tends to decrease, the food tends to decrease, and the cell ten uh, density tends to decrease. So they have a, the cells tend to have a strategy at depth, so no, uh, avoid dividing if you can. So it's not like, uh, that's from Wikipedia, like not uh, uh, those <laughs> on the end of uh, eight-year-old uh, kids on a, on a petri dish. And the energy in that case, they take advantage of every electron uh, transferring system that can uh, take. So here that's some of the most energetic one with the, oxyge the, the oxygenic respiration, but that could be also iron uh, oxidation or iron reduction, depending if it's electron donors or electron acceptors. At depth, so the energy in some settings, uh, there could be also uh, locations where uh, life actually uh, does not necessarily require a lot of uh, energy. That's uh, 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 Everett Shock, who's working at Arizona State University, has dedicated his entire career to calculate uh, the energy of the, the different um, uh, metabolic uh, pathways and uh, metabolic reactions and uh, etc. And here it's a very uh, it's a very nice example that was, that was published in 2010, so I think it, it gathered the, the, the data for at least three or four decades of experimental and theoretical uh, work. So they applied all the thermodynamic data that they have gathered to the geological setting of the, the, the seafloor hydrothermal system along the mid-oceanic uh, ridges. To make, it, uh, to make it short, that's this diagram here that represents the cost of methanogenesis uh, at the different uh, uh, at the, at the different um, uh, spring uh, so hydrothermal uh, springs uh, so uh, in the in the in the seafloor hydrothermal system so everything that's uh, above the, the the zero affinity line means that it's uh, uh, exo 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 energetic so exothermic as well it releases energy. So the way they calculate it, because they have to take into account a lot of parameters. So that's how they, they end up with this representation. And in some in few cases, so it requires energy. So you see here that for um, sites that are well known, that uh, the, the rainbow, so that's the, the, the famous 
uh, black smoker, but also in many others. So there is, a, there is a, a large range of conditions in terms of temperature that think at 250 bars, so it's a little below the, the surface. So such a, a, meta, a, a metabolic reaction actually does not cost life, energy to life, it releases energy and can feed potentially some other microorganism in the consortia. That's for the one metabolic activity, one metabolic pathway, but it's also the case for uh, the synthesis of some uh, amino acids. Here I've just selected a couple of uh, uh, two, two amino acids, so leucine and alanine. So you see here also that in some cases it, it doesn't work, so it always requires energy, um, but not, not systematically. Uh, and uh, when we go to the glucose synthesis, that's something that requires energy definitely. Uh, if we go at the, the, the synthesis of some, uh, uh, nucleic, uh, uh, some uh, nucleobase, like the timine, so that also almost systematically requires energy. So that means that for some functions, the cells would need energy, but that energy could be provided by some other, some meta other metabolic pathways. So that's a system that's, that can work. We always, what the, my point here is that we often hear that life requires energy. No, sometimes there are conditions where life does not necessarily require energy. It can, from the environment, produce its own energy. So that's a sentence, a quotation from Everett Shock. So many autotrophs in the hydrothermal systems, biosynthesis as, act as a free lunch that they are paid to eat. So I think that really summarizes well uh, the thing. So it's been pushed forward. Uh, by the next generation, Lauro and uh, Amanda. So here they compiled uh, data and calculations for terrestrial hot springs for a uh, shallow sea hydrothermal system, a uh, deep sea hydrothermal system. They calculated the Gibbs free energy of potential catabolic reaction. There's a combination of 19 electron donors, 14 electron acceptors. Uh, so they evaluated that for uh, 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 322 data sets and the geochemistry, so pressure, temperature, pH, salinity, uh, exact chemical composition, hydrogen, etc. Uh, of 30 distinct seats, this system, so that turned into uh, seven, 740 reactions considered. And among those reactions, uh, you see that most of them are hexagonic at one or more sites. And that's the case, for instance, of the hydrogenotrophic acetogenesis, that is a very low energy metabolism, does not require energy. Here that's, that's, uh, that's represented with the, the, uh, the, the reactions, so are the most uh, hexagonic on the left and goes uh, to what the less hexagonic ones. And you see that for each reaction, depending on the environmental conditions, the energy can span three or four orders of magnitude that's the size of each of these little lines. So that's one reaction, but in different conditions. And then when you talk the total in terms of energy, it spans over 12 orders of magnitude. So the energy in the systems to live may be very different depending on the composition, depending on the metabolic activity that is considered. So it's not a very trivial uh, thing than to consider uh, the energy for living systems. Now, if I go to the energy budget, so I think you're very familiar uh, with the energy that is provided to the surface of the Earth. So the solar constant that is divided by four because the, turn, the, Earth, the, the Earth is running, etc. So, uh, but there's also the internal energy flux from the Earth that is uh, more modest. So you have here uh, 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 schematics of the Earth. It's a, a compilation of the data plus models. So the average heat flux at the surface of the Earth is 82 milliwatt per square meters. So that goes to, a, that sums up to a 42 terawatt at the surface of the Earth, with most of the heat being released along uh, the mid-oceanic uh, ridges and uh, in uh, also subduction, uh, subduction zones uh, like, uh, like, 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 uh, like here. You have here, here these really nice Icelandic spots. Uh, hot, uh, hot spots, uh, and uh, we do have some uh, some here as well. So the most at the mid-oceanic ridges and the, the hot spots 
and the less in the subduction zones. So that's part of it. So basically, I won't detail just as a reminder. So the water is liquid at the surface of the Earth, uh, not because of the distance of the sun uh, and, and the Earth, so, but because of the, 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 the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. So uh, we complain, about, uh, <laughs> complain a lot about the, the CO2 level of the atmosphere, but I remind you that if we didn't have the right amount of water in the atmosphere, the right amount of CO2 and a bit of methane as well, so the actual temperature at the surface of the Earth would be minus 18 and not uh, the 15 degrees C as we do have it now. So I won't, I won't go. Uh, so we are right at the right spot right now. <laughs> uh, this was not necessarily the, the case. So I've took that from the National uh, Academy uh, uh, of Science uh, uh, book uh, here that was uh, proposed by James Green. So as a function of time, so we are here. That's where we're going in the future. That's where we were. In terms of the, 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 so the sun power was a lot less at the beginning. It reaches 100% now, and it will continue increasing as a function. In, will increase as a function of time. We are now here. That's where we come from, and we were not necessarily at the very, very, very beginning in the habitable zone. However, Mars was, and Venus was as well, but they evolved uh, differently in the two cases. The stability of a time. That's something I want to uh, expand a little more. So. Uh, my short message uh, is that uh, if there wasn't uh, plate tectonics, there wouldn't be life on Earth probably over the, the long period of time. Here, that's uh, uh, the most exhaustive uh, carbon cycle that's been produced by the, the, this program, Deep Carbon Observatory. So the amount in the core, uh, the size of the point is pro uh, pro that's in log scale, in proportional to the, lo the, the, the log of the amount in the reservoirs. But you see here that there is a lot, and you have in, in blue, uh, the fluxes. So you see that you have a deep blue arrow that brings back carbon into the mantle and you have also a number of blue, la blue fluxes that brings carbon dioxide uh, to, the, to the atmosphere. Uh, the mid-oceanic, uh, on the uh, oceanic islands, uh, in, uh, on, the mar on the margins, uh, you do have that in the subduction, in the volcanoes as well, mid-oceanic ridges. So there is a very intense exchange and the mantle that buffers uh, the carbon cycle and the CO2 cycle at the surface of the Earth. This can be, so here that's a nice picture, it's better seen when we look at a, a bar's uh, diagram. Uh, here you have a, a positive fluxes towards the atmosphere, you have, here you have negative fluxes, so burying of, uh, of carbon. Uh, so you see that basically what we have now is that we have a cycle that is at, uh, in a steady state, so I'm not saying that it's at equilibrium, but it's at steady state. It's not at steady state all over the planet. Let's, if I take a, the example of subdu the subduction zones, in some cases uh, it may not be balanced, but overall it is balanced. And uh, we do have this anthropogenic uh, contr contribution to the atmosphere here that is not negligible. You see here from the size of the scale bars, that's a, a very important uh, component uh, that balances uh, uh, the CO2 concentration in the, atmo the atmosphere. That's the weathering and the precipitation, the weathering and the precipitation uh, of uh, carbonate and organic uh, carbon, and also the silicate weathering. And the silicate ba weathering basically is due to uh, the distribution of, cha of mountain change at the surface of the Earth. So it's directly linked uh, to, the, uh, to, to the plate tectonics. So here you do have the fluxes. So you see the spans over orders of magnitude, but everything tends to be, uh, to be balanced. But it's, it's not always balanced in terms also of time scales. You do have here uh, the same, same representation. So we do take the same fluxes, but here there is the response time that is given. So when we're talking about the fluxes from the uh, interior of the Earth, uh, to the surface, so we're talking to very long time scale. When we're talking about what's going on in the exogenic uh, reservoirs, it's going more from uh, the year to a thousand year. So, but basically the long-term uh, volcanic uh, climate is actually controlled right now uh, by the amount of carbon in the uh, uh, exogenic cycle and over the million year time scales. So this exogenic carbon, so it's also controlled by the outgassing of the Earth's interior, by the volcanism, the me metamorphism, or the sec and the sequestration of carbon and organic carbon 
through silicate weathering and photosynthesis. So the response of the silicate weather, the response time for the silicate weathering is on the order of a uh, 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 couple of times, a uh, thousand, uh, uh, hundred thousand years, meaning that the amount of carbon in the uh, exo and controls the amount of uh, carbon in the exogenic uh, cycle that co controls the climate. So we do have a very strong feedback from the interior of the Earth and in particular the weathering to control the climate over the long time, the long uh, scale. So the carbon cycle is the one that we know the best. We do have also some drawings for the nitrogen cycles. Nitrogen may ha really have a lot of, uh, 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 a large, no uh, spans a large number of oxidation uh, state from the, the mantle to the uh, exogenic reservoirs. So there's a lot of electron transfers with the cycling uh, nitrogen, but there's a very nice uh, cycle of uh, the nitrogen and that also strongly relies on subduction zones and on volcanism to be balanced. If we don't have that, it's over. Although it doesn't have a very strong uh, implication for the, the climate. But for life, it would not work like for carbon. Uh, we do have here the same uh, for our water. So same, the water uh, cycle is also balanced what be from between what comes out uh, at, subdu at uh, mid-oceanic regions or back out basins and what comes in uh, in subduction zones. Uh, remember also that uh, we do have one ocean at the surface of the Earth. In the interior of the Earth also we don't necessarily know exactly how much water we do have, but this could go up to a couple of ocean mass. With, and in particular there's one zone that is targeted in the interior of the Earth, that's the transition zone, just uh, so between 4, 10, 410 kilometers and 670 kilometers, and that's a zone where the minerals and the rocks can actually uh, host a lot of, uh, of water. Like for the carbon cycle, the water cycle is globally balanced at the surface of the Earth and for billion years. However, locally, at some subduction zones, it may not be balanced. So it's a very, it's a very uh, sweet uh, spot that we have uh, with this uh, system. And that, that also triggers uh, the, the control on the redox state of the atmosphere. So that means that on planets where there is plate tectonics, on planets where there isn't, uh, well, that has a very strong uh, influence and strong control on the, on the, the composition and, uh, and obviously on the temperature of the atmosphere. So we are really here at the, at the sweet spot. So Venus, that has exactly the same uh, size, etc., as the Earth, could have become like the Earth, but now, because it doesn't have plate tectonics, it may have had plate tectonics for maybe five, uh, 500 million years, but that stopped. And now it has a very thick atmosphere, 90, atm at 90 atmospheres, composed mostly of carbon dioxide and temperature of 482 degrees C. Mars is smaller. Mars has lost most of its atmosphere, and we'll talk about it wh why, to some extent. It has very low uh, atmospheric pressure uh, that is also composed mostly of CO2 and has a very uh, low uh, uh, temperature at the surface. So that brings me to the last uh, point uh, here, uh, that is that uh, uh, what controls also the atmosphere, what controls also the, the, the atmosphere, the re retaining the atmospheres at the surface of the, of the planet, is also related to the long-term cooling of the, atmos of the planet. Here you do have the uh, Earth Dynamo, uh, and it's a, 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 a picture of simulations that is responsible uh, for the magnetic field at the surface of, uh, of the Earth that interacts here with the solar uh, magnetic uh, wind. So that's really, if we didn't have this uh, magnetic field, we think that it started on the Earth about 4.5 million years ago. That's the, the, the furthest evidence that we do have in the geological record. This is due to the cooling of the Earth and to uh, chemical exchanges between the inner core and the outer core that really helps also the plate tectonics and probably it really was uh, really, uh, really important when we thinking about the beginning of the plate tectonics as we know it now. So that was, that's also uh, mandatory to have a plate tectonics, to have uh, the proper atmosphere and also uh, to have uh, life on, on Earth. 
So and so in, when we when we talk, think uh, of on Mars, so the stripping of the carbon of, uh, and the oxygen at the surface of uh, Mars probably uh, occurred uh, when there was a, so the magnetic field was not enough and the stripping of the carbon and oxygen uh, uh, was induced by the strong solar wind that began about that began about 4.1 billion years ago, and this corresponds actually to when the Martian uh, magnetic field uh, stopped. So that it has also a very strong importance, and on the long term, on the long, uh, on the longer term, it also helps the life and prevents uh, cells uh, from uh, mutations. So I will uh, leave you with this um, summary. So <laughs> it's a quotation from uh, Anna Chara and collaborators. Well, the heart of uh, habitability on uh, Earth and potentially elsewhere uh, is in the planetary uh, interior. So. It, on a planet like Earth, well, there is a dynamo where there is plate tectonics, there is recycle, there is the right amount of uh, uh, life uh, essential uh, volatile elements. In other planets that have no dynamics, uh, even if there is uh, some uh, stagnant lead, uh, dynamics, so that systematically leads to a, a dry surface and there's no life there. So I think that summarizes well uh, the conditions for the habitability of the Earth. Thank you. And I'm happy to take your questions.